Today we're gonna to be building some big triangles, a bunch of smaller triangles, some comb looking pieces, and some rectangles. And if we're lucky, when we put them all together, they're gonna to be a crazy looking bench to sit on. If you've watched just about any woodworking video on the internet, you know that almost every project starts the same way, and that is with breaking down rough material and milling it. Well, we aren't breaking the mold here, so that's exactly what I did with this one, and I first started by working on the two large walnut panels that would become the sides of my bench. So while I walk back and forth milling this walnut, let's take a quick look at what I'm building. A lot of times when designing furniture, there are a ton of different variables that will dictate the way a piece looks or functions. Oftentimes, things like client requirements and budget play a big part. Or if we're making plans for a piece, we have to think about teachability or how easily different skill levels can reproduce something. But every once in a while, we get the opportunity to make something for ourselves that doesn't have to fulfill all of these requirements. And in the case of this bench, Really, the only requirement was that someone could sit on it. So I essentially got to do whatever I wanted with the design, and this is what I came up with. Kind of a slatted, triangular, interlocking, modern version of an old telephone bench. You know, for talking on the telephone. Hello? But now that I had the walnut milled, I could start mapping out the shape of my side panels. One of the nice things about a piece like this is that a lot of parts don't need to be accurate to a certain dimension. Honestly, I couldn't even tell you what most of the angles and measurements are on this piece since I really just designed it to look good to my eye. So like in this situation, getting this corner angle to a specific degree measurement wasn't critical and that really makes the design and build process much more organic or at the very least more enjoyable. To draw out the rest of the shape of my side panels, I dry fit and clamp together the two boards that would be glued together, and this allowed me to mark out both shapes completely, which meant I could mark in where I'd be placing my dominoes, and that would help ensure I wouldn't be putting them somewhere that would end up on a cut line when cutting out the individual side panels in a minute. Now that I had one big panel with both of my side panels marked out, I just needed to simply cut the large panel down the middle to start shaping the two halves. And as you can see, sometimes the simple tasks are the ones that almost stump us. So with the crisis averted and the panel cut in two, I could start shaping the first half, which would become the template for the second half. A couple quick cuts and some sanding and the first panel was to its final shape. And like I mentioned before, because I wasn't shooting for perfectly specific measurements or dimensions, all I had to do was ensure that the two panels were the same. Just as I would with any other template, I can trace out the shape, rough cut on the bandsaw, then using a router and a couple template and flush trim bits, I can get the second panel to be a perfect duplicate of the first. With the two main walnut side panels pretty much finished, I could get to work on the other two main parts of the bench, and those are the walnut slats and the maple panels, which create the opposite end support, as well as become the interlocking slats, and of course, a place to set your telephone. Hello? 
The main thing I needed to consider at this point was that I milled all of these parts to the exact same thickness. That would allow everything to be spaced evenly across the width of the bench and let everything line up properly. So I first started by making the maple panels and I needed 10 of these and I made them in a very similar way as I did the walnut panels. I once again made one panel on its own to become the template panel and once I had that one ready to go, I prepared larger panels that would yield four maple panels each and I could once again dry fit those together and trace out my template shape to make sure I could cut in dominoes and not risk exposing them on any cut lines once the individual panels were cut out. And once these were glued up, I could break down each larger panel into rough shapes, then trace my template onto each one and start the trimming process. If you've watched some of our other videos, you're probably wondering why I didn't make MDF templates for this piece. Most of the time when making a piece, I'll make a template usually using our CNC router, and most of the time, the parts I'm making with these templates require a lot of dimensional accuracy. The reason why I opted not to make MDF templates for this piece is because, like I mentioned earlier, the parts I'm making don't require a ton of accuracy, they just need to be replicated multiple times. It didn't matter if an angle was slightly off, or a dimension was a little long or short, as long as I liked the way the first panel I made looked, I was happy using that one as the template, so there was really no reason to make a separate MDF version. A piece like the rocking chair I designed last year requires very accurate parts to be replicated multiple times on the piece, so making MDF templates is definitely the way to go for something like this. I'll link to that video as well as another one I made all about making and using templates in the description. So now that I had all of the maple panels to size, I could cut some long walnut strips that would become the slats of the bench. These were obviously simple to make, just a few rip cuts on the table saw and those were done. Then I could start working on the cross pieces. These pieces took a little bit of setup to get just right and I'm essentially making one side of a box joint for these. I've made box joint jigs in the past and they work well, but for this application, I decided to use a version of the drill bit dado method to see if I could make that work. We put out a video a few weeks ago with a few different woodworking tips and tricks, and one of them is this drill bit technique. I'll link to that video in the description if you haven't seen it, but this technique is something I've been using for a long time and it always works really well, so I wanted to see if I could make it work for this. The gist of it is that you use a scrap of material that's the same thickness as the pieces that will fit into the open slots. And you use a drill bit to essentially offset your workpiece from your stop to account for the blade curve. So once I had the first one cut, I could check my fit and make sure everything was looking good. And once I knew that it was, I could just repeat this process down the entire length of the cross pieces, which I had stuck together with double-sided tape so that I was making two identical parts. I'll be honest, it was a slightly tedious process, but since I only had to do it once, I felt the time spent making a box joint jig and setting up a dado blade would have taken just as long, if not longer, and this ended up working perfectly. Hey, real quick, before we keep going, I want to thank Warby Parker for sponsoring today's video. So obviously around here, we're all glasses wearers, wearers of glasses. Either way, we all wear glasses and I've actually been wearing Warby Parker glasses for years now. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses. And one of the first things that got me interested in Warby Parker is how easy they make the try on and buying process. You go on their website, take a quiz, and they give you a bunch of options based on your answers. From there, you pick your five favorites, which they ship to you for free, and you can try them on at home with zero obligation to buy. One of the things I never enjoyed about buying glasses was having to try them on in a store with random people staring at me. So now I can do this at home with only two people staring at me, so here are the three pairs that my team and I felt looked the best. Let me know what you think in the comments below. After you make your selection, glasses start at just $95, including the prescription lenses. So if you're in the market for new glasses, definitely try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. 
order five pairs of glasses to try on at home for free for five days. There's no obligation to buy, ships free, and includes a prepaid return shipping label. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash four eyes. All right, thanks Warby Parker. With those parts finished, I essentially had all of the pieces for the entire bench cut to final shape and I could start assembling. This piece was a little unique as the assembly process was just about as time consuming as the fabricating process was, so let's get into it. I first needed to figure out the placement of the slats on the maple panels as this would be the main connection point of the piece. So I used one of the walnut panels to mark its vertical height then did the same with a maple panel, and I could find the difference between the two to figure out how far down from the top of the maple panel to attach the slats. Now that I had the placement of the slats on the maple panels, I could mark the angle onto the ends of the slats and cut those. These would be getting sanded flush later, so they didn't need to be perfect, just close enough. And finally, I could make a little spacer jig that would allow me to accurately and consistently place the slats and attach them to the maple panels. Okay, so with that, I was finally ready to start assembling and I opted to use glue and screws at each connection point. I felt like this would give me the most strength and it would allow me to assemble the entire piece at one time instead of having to glue and clamp and wait for stuff to dry before proceeding. So you can see here, I would clamp the spacer jig in place, then add glue and screws to attach the walnut slats. I also cut a second spacer piece to attach the lower spacer blocks. The placement of these was less critical I just needed to make sure they were all even with each other, and some glue, a couple brad nails to tack it in place, then a screw and they were firmly attached. Once I had the walnut slat and maple spacer attached, I could then attach another maple panel on top of those using the same spacer jig as before. I just needed to make sure I was offsetting the screws on each layer so they wouldn't run into each other, and I could just repeat this process up until all the layers were attached to each other. One other thing I did during the assembly process was apply some finish to all of the inside faces, as it would obviously be pretty difficult to get to these once everything was put together. Now that the slats and maple panels were attached to each other, I could get the cross pieces into place, which would hold all of the slats and get them spaced evenly, and really make it start to look like a usable bench. This was pretty straightforward, and keeping with the theme of this assembly, I just used some glue and screws. Though on the end cross piece, once I trimmed all of the excess length from the slats, I then needed to glue on some extra thickness. This was a kind of on the fly decision, but I realized I needed a bit more material to make a strong connection to the walnut side panels, as well as being able to match the back angle without cutting into any joinery or screws. So while that glue was drying, I could sand all the excess slat and spacer material flush to the maple panels, then get to work on attaching the walnut side panels. clamped the two side panels in place and got a first look at the bench as a whole, then I could start marking out where I'd be cutting in the dominoes. Though using dominoes was definitely a quick and accurate way to attach these, I still needed to be thoughtful as I needed to use multiple domino sizes and plunge depths depending on which joint it was. I think I used three different sized dominoes and multiple plunge depths to ensure I wouldn't be cutting into any screws or plunging too far anywhere. But once I had everything figured out and all of the mortises cut in, I could glue on the two walnut panels. I did these separately to avoid trying to flip the entire piece over during the glue up, and I only filmed gluing on one side. So with a little movie magic, we can imagine how the second glue up went. 
Now that all of the parts had finally been combined to officially become a bench, I had a couple final details to take care of. I needed to trim the back cross piece to match the angle of the walnut side panels. So a quick cut with my tracks. Oh, the blade wasn't big enough to cut all the way through. Okay, cool. So a quick cut with my track saw and a not so quick cut with a handsaw. Then I could sand that end piece flush with the side panels. Once again, crisis averted. And finally, I needed to trim a small flat spot at the two points where the bench would be sitting on the ground, and I could do that with my track saw as well. From there, it was just some sanding and adding finish, and when I say just, I actually mean a lot. It was tedious sanding, and spraying on the finish was a little tricky to get it into all of the small gaps, but I think it ended up turning out great. And honestly, these kinds of builds are really some of my favorites. Being able to kind of build as I go and not have to be locked down to predetermined dimensions and specifications really allows for some freedom that we don't often get when building furniture, and I feel like it comes across in the finished piece. It's a building process that I wish we had more opportunity to explore, and I think I'll always have that little voice in my head telling me to build more stuff like this. So I guess what it comes down to is the fact that when the opportunity finally does call, there's really only one thing we can do. Hello?